Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for our webinar this afternoon on traineeship opportunities in the European Commission and the European Parliament. Um, apologies for the slight delay in, in going live with you. As you know, there's a YouTube outage and I hope you've managed to join us in the workaround that we've uh, come up with today. Um, this is, a, I think, a topic of great interest uh, to you and I'm going to quickly go through the running order. In a couple of moments, uh, I'm going to ask the Irish Permanent Representative to the European Union, Ambassador Tom Haney, to say a few words to you. Then we will have video messages from European Affairs Minister Thomas Byrne, TD, and from Noel O'Connell from European Movement Ireland. And after that, I'm going to moderate a discussion with our two trainees, sally Ann Malone and Kate Moriarty, who will give us their experience of the traineeship experience. Um, you can ask us uh, questions uh, for the Q&A, and you can do that by logging into uh, Slido. And the code to log in there is EU Jobs. That's capital E, U, capital U, capital J, O, B, S, all one word, EU Jobs. So without further ado, I'm going to invite Ambassador Hani to uh, say some welcome remarks today. Over to you, Tom. Uh, thanks, Eamon. Good, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and greetings from the Irish Permanent Representation here in Brussels, uh, and welcome to this virtual webinar. Uh, we would very much like to see you all in physical form, but unfortunately circumstances don't permit. Uh, and as we've discovered, uh, these virtual formats and these webinars allow us to reach a much larger audience than we normally would. Uh, and we are very keen to stay in contact with Irish people who are interested in the European Union and who are particularly interested in having a career with one of the EU institutions. Um, you're probably very familiar with the huge influence the European Union is having on all our lives. Just uh, in the last week, uh, I attended the European Council of Heads of State and Government, where they finally signed off on the huge multi-annual financial framework package which would allow us to mobilize 1.8 trillion euro in support of European economic recovery after COVID. We also agreed on a new climate policy which aims to reduce European carbon dioxide emissions by 55% by 2030. And of course, overshadowing much of this work is the continuing Brexit negotiations, which will shape the European Union's future relationship with the United Kingdom for generations to come. So that just gives you a small flavour of many issues which have a huge influence over our lives in Ireland. And this is why it's important for us to have as many Irish people working in the European institutions as possible. If you work for a new, as an Irish citizen for a European Union institution, you bring a knowledge of Ireland, you bring a cultural background, you bring a sensitivity to our concerns, which, was, which otherwise would be lacking. So we are very keen to stay in contact with any of you who want to pursue a career in the European institutions. Our Minister of State at the Department, Thomas Byrne, uh, we will have a video from him now in a minute. He has put uh, EU jobs for Irish citizens at the top of his agenda. It's also a key point in the programme uh, for government. And we are keen to increase the number of successful Irish candidates coming through the EU's recruitment processes. Uh, we'll also have a, a video following Minister Byrne from uh, Noel Campbell, uh, the head of the European Movement Ireland, whom we work closely with here in the representation uh, in promoting EU jobs and promoting Irish citizens' interest in those jobs. Um, I look forward uh, to hearing our, our two panellists and thank them for uh, participating, Sally Ann Malone and Kate Moriarty. Um, they will be able to answer many of your uh, practical questions about how to go about working uh, in, an e inst in an EU institution. And at, at the end of this session today, uh, we hope that you'll all have an awareness uh, that different ways, there are of the different ways that you can enter uh, European Union, Union institutions. You should have a deeper understanding of the traineeship opportunities available in, in the institutions. Uh, and you should be aware that people from very different backgrounds have opportunities for working uh, in the EU. So I hope you enjoy the seminar. Uh, it, it's, it's the first of many, uh, and we hope that you it sparks your interest. 
And if you are interested uh, in working in an EU institution and going through the recruitment processes, please stay in contact with us here, with Eamon and his colleagues. We can provide you with lots of advice uh, and practical support uh, as you embark on, on your career. So uh, pity I can't see you all, but I, I hope you enjoy the session. Thanks. Steve Galair, I'm thrilled to launch this first in a new series of webinars focusing on EU careers. Look, this series comes at a really important stage in our work in support of those seeking EU jobs. The permanent representation of Ireland uh, in the EU has played a key role, along with the Department of Foreign Affairs here in HQ, in keeping people aware and informed about EU jobs. So to ensure that these information sessions continue as we move online, we've decided to launch these series of webinars with a focus on launching our EU career. While I'd love to be here with everybody in person today, online events come with the benefit that we can have a bigger and more diverse audience, and there are people watching from all over the world, and Gurumila Mahagu. So I'd like to say, fall your oath. I hope that you find this event and the rest of the series to be helpful and informative. Today's webinar will focus on traineeship opportunities in the Commission and in the Parliament. EU traineeships are a really great way to gain valuable experience in the institutions, learn about their workings, make connections with existing staff. You, they can often be a first step in your European Union career. I've made it a personal priority to renew our commitment to seeing Irish people succeed in obtaining EU jobs. Irish officials working in the European Union know our culture, our system and our priorities and can help shape and implement European Union policies that work for Ireland. We are facing a demographic cliff in terms of the representation among permanent staff in the EU institutions. Almost 30% of Irish officials are over 58 years of age and will retire in the next decade. This means that levels of Irish representation are going to fall dramatically in light of those retirements. At the same time, there are fewer Irish citizens entering into the system at junior grades. We're determined to take action and ensure more people like you secure permanent positions in the institutions. We're determined to have a wide and diverse bunch of Irish people starting their careers in the European Union. So that's why the Programme for Government commits to the development of a strategy to increase the number of you in the European institutions. I've held meetings with key contacts in the European Union institutions about our concerns and the need to address this issue. So back in October, I launched a public consultation to help the development of the new strategy. We've received really valuable contact, perhaps from some of you, uh, and we're going to take steps based on that uh, to implement a new strategy. The new strategy will look at ways of increasing our presence in the institutions and how we can encourage more Irish people to consider pursuing a European career. The strategy, of course, builds on all the good work that has gone on before in the promotion of European Union jobs. The Department of Foreign Affairs provides supports to Irish citizens applying for jobs in the European Union at every step of the process, including online practice packs, one-to-one -one training, depending on the stage as well. It is my hope that these supports and the actions that flow from the new strategy will ensure that a new generation of Irish graduates, diverse, uh, is really important, that, that you all go on to have successful careers in the EU, as Irish people have done throughout our membership. So I'd encourage anybody listening today with an interest in finding out more about EU careers to attend this webinar series and explore all the opportunities that are available. The DFA EU Jobs website has a lot of practical advice if you're interested in pursuing a career in the institutions. So go to the site www.dfa.ie forward slash EU jobs. I wish you the best of luck as you pursue opportunities in the European institutions. Gurumila Mahagav Galer. Thank you, Minister. And now let's hear from Noel O'Connell from European Movement Ireland, an organisation the department works very closely with on this agenda. Hello there, a very good afternoon to you all. My name is Noelle O'Connell and I'm the CEO of European Movement Ireland. And I'm delighted to be addressing you today for this first in a new series of EU jobs webinars called Launching Your EU Career. Many thanks indeed to Ambassador Hanny for very kindly inviting me to speak to you all today alongside Minister Thomas Byrne and a fantastic panel of speakers. Indeed, we in European Movement Ireland have a long and established connection and great track record with the Perm Rep, 
who very kindly host our biannual Brussels Connection events every year. And we look forward to continuing to work alongside Ambassador Hanny and Eamon McKay for this exciting new series of webinars on EU jobs, which is really, really timely. For those of you who might not be very familiar with European Movement Ireland, by way of background, we are the longest established voluntary, not-for-profit membership organisation working in the field of European affairs here in Ireland. And for over 65 years, we have worked to develop that connection between Ireland and Europe to achieve greater understanding and engagement with the EU and our European partners here in Ireland through the provision of objective information by stimulating debate and encouraging dialogue and information sharing. So a key part of EM Ireland's work is the whole area of promoting EU jobs. And in that regard, we are delighted to be working really closely with Minister Thomas Byrne, with the Department of Foreign Affairs through their EU Jobs Initiative, and of course, the Perm Rep in promoting the opportunities that are available to us as Irish people of careers in the European Union. And how do you get on that ladder? Well, firstly, traineeships in the various institutions, agencies and bodies are a fantastic way to start your career in the EU. Um, in terms of the European Commission and the Parliament, indeed, many of our own colleagues here and many colleagues working further afield have been stagiaires in the EU institutions and have gone on to, to, to greater things, working in the Commission, working in the Parliament and all across the various agencies and institutions. And as we all know, Ireland has been very well represented across uh, the, the various bodies. But the important thing is we need to make sure that graduates and that young professionals take up the baton and continue that really strong record that Ireland has in punching above its weight and maintaining a strong Irish footprint and pipeline across the agencies, bodies and institutions. We have had a great record of notable Irish people who have achieved incredible success at the very height of their careers in the EU. Of the five Secretary Generals, two have been Irish. David O'Sullivan and Catherine Day. Emily O'Reilly is the EU Ombudsman. And most recently, Aymer Cook is the Executive Director of the European Medicines Agency. So how can we in European Movement Ireland help you in navigate your EU career journey? How can we help you take that first step on the career ladder? We are here to support you every step of the way, and we offer a wide variety of resources and help to help you get on that ladder. So firstly, our EMI weekly jobs newsletter. It's the only one of its kind in Europe where you will receive directly into your inbox all the latest job opportunities across the institutions and agencies. So in effect, it's your first signpost for having a look and seeing what's available out there. Our Green Book, it's our flagship Bible uh, written by trainees and stagiaires, and it's a guide to living and working in Europe. And in fact, early in 2021, we will be launching the 14th of edition of this popular guide. So it's gone from strength to strength over the years. And it really is the go-to resource on providing information on everything from applying to traineeships, CV advice, living in Brussels and across the EU, and tips for applying for permanent positions and the process for the concours. One-to-one -one career clinics. We also provide candidates with career advice and we help signpost graduates to the resources that you need to need to advance your career in the EU. And I might just touch upon some of our top tips for applying for traineeships, because I think that's really important uh, for people to be aware of. So firstly, number one, research. Research the institutions, the agencies, and the organizations which are relevant to your interests and experience. And number two, apply for multiple traineeships. Don't just limit yourself to the most popular traineeships because there's a huge variety and range there, and you have a really good chance if you apply for more. Number three, tailor your application, outlining your skills, and remember to reinforce that English is your mother tongue, if, you, if that's the case. And time, don't rush your applications. Remember, what's your USP? What makes you stand out from all the other applications that they're going to receive? And lastly, and perhaps more importantly, proofread your application. 
don't have any spelling mistakes. If possible, get somebody else to read over it for you to sense check it as well. So we in European Movement Ireland have recently launched a podcast on EU jobs as an extra resource for you, along with Minister Byrne, our EU jobs lead, my colleague Kieran Murray, um, and we have a number of professionals already working in the EU agencies who have been our first guests on the EU jobs podcast. So please make sure to listen back on our EMI player where you'll see all of our podcasts and some very practical EU jobs webinars that we have done as well. Um, and on our website, you'll find our EU jobs page where you can subscribe to our weekly jobs list and download our green book. Don't hesitate to get in touch with us if you have any queries or if there's any advice we can, we can possibly provide to you or for any other information on the traineeships across the EU. On my own behalf, again, if I may thank Ambassador Hanny for the invitation, to Eamon McKay, Minister Byrne, and to all the staff and colleagues in the Perm Rep on this fantastic initiative on setting up this series of webinars on EU jobs. As ever, we in European Movement Ireland look forward to continuing to collaborate, work and support with Minister Byrne, Ambassador Hanny, and the Perm Rep and the Department of Foreign Affairs in this fantastic initiative on EU jobs. I wish you all the very best of luck in researching and being successful and getting on that EU jobs ladder. Thank you. Thanks very much, Noelle. Well, now let's move maybe to the, the core of uh, today's webinar, which is uh, chats we're going to have with uh, sally Ann Malone and with Kate Moriarty. And just to remind you, before I speak individually to both of them, that at the end of the session, there will be a Q&A where your own questions can be reflected and you can get those posed by opening Slido and entering the code EU jobs. So, uh, sally -Ann, welcome to you, first of all. Thank you very much for joining us. Maybe you could begin by just giving us a few words about your educational and professional background. Thanks, Eamon, and thanks for having me. It's, it's great to be here today. Um, so my educational background, um, well, as an undergraduate student, I studied at NUI Galway. Um, I studied a Bachelor of Civil Law for four years. And following that, I undertook a Master of Public Policy in University College Dublin. Um, I did that full time for 12 months and um, was very fortunate uh, on the day I completed my Master's to secure a Schumann traineeship. Um, and following um, the Schumann traineeship, I became um, a parliamentary assistant and I've been in the European Parliament since. Thanks, Sally. Maybe you could tell us a little bit then about your role uh, at the European Parliament. Um, you know, what made you, uh, I suppose, apply for that? What was your motivation in going for a traineeship in the EU? And then specifically a little bit of detail about, about that role. Yes, so um, I suppose I always had um, a very strong interest in going to Brussels and I was always very keen uh, to work in one of the European institutions and so for me um, it seemed like gaining a traineeship was a natural step in, in that progression. Um, so I was quite keen to apply after I completed my studies. Um, I was fortunate enough to be uh, given a traineeship um, at the Director General for Finance, more commonly known as DigiFins. Um, there I was placed in a unit called the MEPS portal. Um, at the MEPS portal, um, all of the um, members' uh, social and financial entitlements are dealt with. Um, so it was a fantastic experience. I had a great exposure to the MEPs and also the inner workings of the Parliament, particularly from an administrative point of view, which uh, was key uh, to furthering my career. Um, and also I just gained invaluable skills there. It gave me the knowledge um, that I needed to, to progress a career within the EU institutions. What was the uh, application process like? I mean, could you talk us through that? Is it complicated? Does it take a long time? Um, yeah, the application process um, can seem quite daunting. Um, I, I believe the uh, Schumann traineeship process is a little bit quicker than the commission. Um, I think you don't have to wait as long to find out whether you've been successful or not. 
Um, so there are two um, traineeship periods um, each year. So there is one from October to the end of February and another from the beginning of March to the end of July. Um, I was uh, an October trainee, uh, meaning then that I had to apply um, during the month of June. Um, so the application process opens for a whole month. Uh, you can only apply for a maximum of three traineeship positions. Um, after you apply, um, you have to wait a month, wait for the month of July when your application is scrutinised and assessed. And then come August 1st, uh, you will be notified as to whether you have been shortlisted or unfortunately if you've been unsuccessful. If shortlisted, uh, you then have to wait another two weeks. Uh, within that two weeks, you have to submit uh, documentation like your passport, um, a copy of your degree and college transcripts, um, along with a, um, you need to provide an eligible police certificate, a proof of criminal record. Um, and once uh, that, that deadline passes, you can be notified anywhere from two days after that up until a week before the traineeship actually begins as to whether you've been successful. Um, so it can be it can be quite a long process and um, you have to be very patient um, but I would encourage everybody to really uh, use the, the months that you have to apply and um, you know take the, the weeks to prepare and see what traineeships are available and um, just use that time wisely uh, it will go in your favour. Thanks, Alain. Maybe you could talk us through briefly your, your current role then and how that came about. Yeah, so um, currently I'm um, an assistant to Deirdre Clune, MEP. Um, prior to this, I was working for the now Commissioner Mairead McGuinness. Um, I was very keen to, to stay on uh, in the European Parliament. Um, I really wanted to learn more about the um, policy and legislative role the the European Parliament has um, and I, I kind of felt it was the right move for me to, to stay where I was so I was very fortunate enough to um, apply for a position with uh, Ms Clune and, and was successful there um, but I have to say um, my traineeship was uh, pivotal and key uh, to me securing both of those positions. Okay <laughs> I suppose a good question might be, what is the single uh, most important piece of advice that you would have for somebody who was thinking of applying for a traineeship? Um, I think going back again to the application process, um, I think it's really, really important. Um, it's, it's the first step you make in, in um, looking for a job within the EU institutions. And I, I think you need to use that, that month you have very wisely. I think you need to be tactile and um, you need to see, um, again, which positions you're very interested in. There's over 450 traineeships available. Uh, as I said earlier, you can only apply for a maximum of three. Um, so you need to see what appeals to you and you need to give yourself time to, to go through that. Also, there's a, a huge volume of applicants uh, to the human traineeships. Um, so you need to be kind of smart about that. And you know, when applying for positions, you can see how many applicants are applying. Uh, so you need to determine uh, whether it's it's worth your while applying for a job that 500 or 600 hundred other people are going for as well. And um, also I would say my biggest piece of advice in um, the application process is um, being specific with each application and um, cater to what the job requirements are for each individual um, traineeship that you're applying for. I think that will really stand to people. Um, you need to remember this is the, the first impression um, your future um, potential supervisor will, will see of you. So you, you need to make sure that that will that, sell. Um, so that would be my best advice. Prepare and use that time wisely when applying. That's uh, super advice, uh, particularly around, I think, tailor, tailoring your CV to the, to the particular uh, role, traineeship, etc. Look, uh, thank you very much. We hope to come back to you at the end if there are other questions, particularly from the Slido exchanges. But let me turn to you, Kay. Um, perhaps again, you could begin by telling us a few words about your education and professional background, because I know you're a, a former commission trainee, uh, and obviously there, there may be different angles there. But let's start with your own education and professional background, if you don't mind sharing that with us, Kate. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here as well. Uh, so I have a little bit of a different background to Sally. I um, studied law and German in Trinity. 
uh, graduated in 2013 and to be fairly honest with you wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do with my life so wanted to open it up a bit and wanted to go into Europe and have a bit of more opportunity because I thought that law was maybe a little bit you know narrow in if I wanted to go into the EU so I decided to do a master's in international relations in Bologna in Italy and I did that for two years graduated and it was actually my mother who sent me a link uh, telling me to apply for the traineeship and we want to keep our man happy so um, at that point I was like okay great I'm going to apply for this um, and uh, yeah I applied for this and then got taken in 2017 and have been in the commission ever since. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about your traineeship, uh, how, 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 how the role is, um, maybe a little bit also about you know that sort of impetus to move to Brussels as well. No problem. So um, basically, I got taken in the Director General for Education, Youth, Sports and Culture. Uh, it was actually my first choice because I, I, at that point, I decided that I thought education was, um, was, was key to, um, well, it, let's say European policy as much as I knew about at that point. Um, so I started in education, uh, youth and sport and culture. And I actually ended up in the finance and accountancy section of it. So I was working in procurement and grants in the legal sector, which actually gave me a great overview of all the programs that we were dealing with. So even if you see an area that maybe you're not really familiar with, uh, don't diss it because you never know what's going to come out of it. Um, so I worked in that for five months and um, then basically I had planned to go back to Bologna and then got offered a job and then another job and then another job and I, I ended up staying in education and culture ever since so delighted so um yeah that was the that was how I stayed and um yeah I, I, the original plan was to go back but you know the the saying is uh, life happens when you're busy making other plans uh, and basically I ended up staying I'm delighted I, um, I stayed uh, Brussels life Brussels um working environment is absolutely fantastic. Uh, anybody who has the opportunity to take an experience as such, honestly, I, I can only say do it. At the end of the day, it's five months of your life and you're going to have a great time. You're going to really, you know, further your career chances in the future. So I, I, I'm happy I took that step. Great. Maybe just going back to the application process, you could talk us through that a little bit. How long did it take? Was it onerous? Uh, any tips in relation to that? Of course. So uh, the commission traineeship, the blue book, it does take a while. So uh, if you're planning to do it, you're not going to be there within three months. Normally the application takes from eight to 10 months, especially now under COVID. Uh, I think there's even delays with that. So it, it does take a while. It is something you have to do in advance. Um, there's a few set, like different steps to the application. The first step is basically a motivation, a simple enough motivation. Uh, it seems long, but at the end of the day, you're basically just explaining why you want to take part in it, why you should be there, and explain a bit what you did in your educational background and your professional career. My first advice on that phase would be keep the language simple. Uh, you're going to have people looking over that application that English is not their first language. So we, we love flowery language and we love the waffle, but, you know, maybe it's good to keep to the basics and to the content. Um, yeah, but basically you do your first round. And then in the second stage, they ask you for um, backup documentation. So if you indicate that you have language skills, for example, you need to be able to back up that you actually have those language skills. So um, don't go saying that you're, I don't know, fluent in Chinese because I don't know your your grandmother lived in China that, that won't work <laughs> unfortunately they're quite bureaucratic in, in that kind of regard but um yeah you need you need basically the only things that I can say for the application is that you do need two EU languages to apply and you need a bachelor degree. Thanks very much. Could you tell us a little bit about your current role then? Yeah, so I um, was a trainee and then I stayed on as a contractual agent, which is basically a way for external people to stay on in the commission after the traineeship. Uh, and now the commission has launched this uh, great new programme called the Junior Professional Programme. Basically, uh, all the trainees uh, in the department, so in the director generals are, um, are eligible and they pick 25 people uh, per session. So every six months they pick 25 people 
to be hired as uh, AD officials in the commission and you do a mobility exercise around the commission. So I, in the last two years, was moved into um, DG MARA, which is Maritime Affairs. I worked on fisheries, which was extremely interesting. Also from an Irish point of view, I then moved on to work in uh, development and cooperation. So I was working on projects that we had in Africa and uh, third world countries around the world, basically before moving back to education and culture. And um, that's where I am at the moment, working in policy. But um, yeah, basically this, this program is absolutely something I would also tell you to look into after your traineeship because it's, it's a great opportunity to stay in the institutions and it gives you the opportunity to take part in internal competition. So I don't know if people know what the competition is for the commission, it's this uh, big, long say procedure and lots of different steps of an exam, I don't want to go into the detail, but uh, you have a kind of a smaller pool doing that exam, so you basically have better chances of going in or getting into the institutions. So something I could definitely advise for any person that's interested in the traineeship, once you're in the traineeship, apply for the junior professional program. Well, that's really good advice. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think what we might try and do is turn it over to Slido now and see what's been coming in. There's, there's obviously a huge interest in uh, this particular webinar and a huge interest in traineeships in general. Uh, one question I have, which I hope uh, one or other of Salian or Kate may have the answer to is, because I, I must confess I don't know it off the top of my own head, one of the eligible, this is coming in, uh, one of the eligibility criteria is a maximum one year of professional experience. Does unrelated professional experience count, for example, uh, teaching English as a foreign language? Would either of you know the answer to that question? Yes. Go ahead, Sally. No, go ahead, Keisha. <laughs> so for the commission, I don't think there's any, uh, there's no cap on what um, experience you can have. There's only a requirement that you cannot have done more than six weeks of work experience within the institutions prior to your traineeship. But as a professional experience in general, there is no cap. You can only, uh, in your application, indicate three different professional experiences. So obviously, when you're writing your application, you want to tailor it to the position you think you're applying to. So I, I pick the three most relevant ones, but there's no uh, cap as such. Okay, thank you very much. That's, that's very clear. Another question I have here coming in on Slido is, are traineeships only for recent graduates? Is there an age limit? Um, no, um, there is, I'm, I'm unaware, I don't think there is an age limit um, for the Schumann traineeships once you're over 18. Um, I would not let your age stop you at all. I had a um, friend who was a trainee with me last year and she was 37. So uh, don't let age be a barrier. If this is something you've always wanted to pursue and the opportunity presents, go for it. And it's the same for the Blue Book traineeship. There is absolutely no age limit. And also be aware that most other European countries tend to graduate later. So there's a very wide age, age range of trainees, as, as Sally said. Okay, great. Uh, well, I'm, I'm looking at another question here, which is asking about, uh, specifically, Kate, about the junior professional program and asking how long does it last for? So the junior professional program lasts for two years. So you have two placements in two different departments. So as I was saying, I was in uh, maritime affairs and then development and cooperation. But in your interview, you can basically tell them a little bit what areas you're interested in and they'll try to also respect that. And then you go back to your original uh, department. So the department you did your traineeship in and you stay in that department, uh, which is they're called director generals, but I say departments, um, for another year. So it's two years in, in total. And then at the end of that, you can sit in internal competition and hopefully you'll you'll get in and then it goes forever. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a, that's a very clear outline of the, of the JPD. And it, it is, I have to say, from a, a, a government perspective, something we have been supportive of. Um, as another route for, for Irish people to, to get in and advance in the institutions. It's limited numbers wise. I mean, you're in a very uh, uh, select crew who have, who have made it onto the program. I think we've only had a couple of Irish uh, since the program began. So it is another way in and it's a, 
it's an important one to emphasize. Um, I have maybe one or two other questions uh, on um, one here on the question of language requirements. Uh, what standard second language requirement is necessary? If one only has leaving cert French, would this be insufficient? Um, I think uh, you have to have quite a good uh, knowledge of your second language. Again, this depends on the, the job you're applying for, and it will be um, specifically required if you do need a, a strong level uh, of knowledge of your second language. Um, a lot of positions uh, do um, request that you have quite a strong uh, knowledge of your second language, but others don't. Uh, for me, exam for example, um, French is my second language. Um, I'm by no means fluent just yet, um, but would have a, a very strong basis with it. Um, but it, it wasn't uh, crucial uh, in attaining my role. So it's just something to watch out very carefully for um, when looking at positions available. And um, if, if, it, if a strong level is required, um, it means a strong level is required. As Kate mentioned earlier, they are quite bureaucratic about this. Um, and uh, they mean they want a good level of your second language. For the Blue Book traineeship, I think that you actually do need uh, a B level in the common framework, the European common framework. So I think, if, if I understood correctly, that's equivalent to a leaving search higher level C level. So if you have a C, that will be, uh, so, so C1 or C2, no, sorry, not C1, uh, A1 or A2. Sorry, I'm getting confused myself now. Uh, A1 or A2 level in the Leaving Cert will be equivalent to a B level in the common European framework. So in the commission, you do need that. And yes, but keep in mind, I mean, you can get to that level. Uh, it's not that difficult. It just takes a few months of practice. You, you could definitely, you know, sit and examine that language and uh, keep in mind you have mother and tongue English. And that's a great, great benefit to you. Everybody is after mother tongue speakers. So uh, you're really, really lucky in that regard. Yeah, and I, I would just add as well that don't forget your Irish um, because that is classified as uh, an official EU language. Um, so do not underestimate your level with that. And the, the European institutions are really keen uh, to attract Irish speakers. Um, so if um, Irish is something you're interested in, don't hesitate to brush it up. And um, another great thing about working for the institutions is that they really encourage you to learn languages and they make that really feasible and accessible. So uh, don't be deterred if um, you feel you're not strong enough with your second language. Um, another question I have here is, um, are there opportunities related to science? Um, possibly. Um, again, this is something that you will need to um, look carefully at um, when the application process opens. Um, I imagine within the Parliament, and it might be the same in the Commission, Kate, um, I'm not sure, um, but in, in um, policy related units, um, scientific um, research may be needed and scientific qualifications may be of benefit to you there. Um, I'm not 100% sure on this, but I, I, I know that there is a whole host of um, uh, career uh, opportunities and academic backgrounds that the, the EP does look for uh, in, in its traineeship process from architects uh, to teachers, so um, it, it's quite possible. Um, same for the Commission, you're, you're definitely, there's loads of areas, basically the Commission has a role to play in most policy areas within the European Union, so if you're interested, if you have a science profile, look maybe into, I don't know, Sante or uh, the European Food Safety Authority, the Joint Research Centre, there's lots of different specific areas that would really be looking for scientific profiles and, and they'd see my profile and they wouldn't know what to do with me, you know, so don't let that be any deterrent, they definitely are looking for specific profiles also in science. Okay, um, how does the um, application work with a master's program if you are still doing the master's during the application and don't have grades yet or a certificate during the month of June? Would either of you have an insight into that issue? So it, it won't, uh, for the Blue Book traineeship, it won't be counted as a completed degree because you haven't completed it as such. You can indicate it and you can indicate when it will finish, but you will, because it's, it's, it's scored on a sort of point system, the whole application, you'll get points for your bachelor, but if it hasn't been completed, the master, points won't be given to it, but it will be seen that it's there and it's being completed. 
Um, I, I was in the middle of my master's when I applied, we're coming to the end of it. Um, so I, I just the one thing I would stress is that uh, you must have your degree and your degree must be awarded six months or more uh, before applying. So if your degree has been awarded within six months of applying, you're not eligible to apply. So it must be six months or older. And I, I really would stress that because I don't think it's it's known sometimes. Um, and it can be um, disappointing for undergraduates because um, there can be quite long delays for graduations. Um, so that's something I would um, advise people to look into. OK, um, we have actually a very long list of Slido questions and I'm afraid the clock is against it. But what we might undertake to do, uh, I will ask colleagues to gather those and maybe to seek uh, some of the insight uh, of uh, sally Ann and Kate and come back. Uh, to you maybe via email, uh, although I, I see many of the contributions have been uh, received anonymously. Um, so that might be the best way to deal with that. Um, so uh, ha having said that, I, I want to really thank our two speakers today uh, in particular uh, for their practical insights. I also want to, of course, uh, thank uh, my colleague Ambassador Tom Hanny for, for joining us, uh, and of course Minister Byrne uh, and Noel O'Connell for their video messages. Um, while we focused today on traineeships, um, we will be looking in future webinars at other uh, ways of getting into the institutions and at other careers in the institutions. And maybe in that context, to mention something that might be of interest to many people watching this webinar, which is that the next round of the Junior Professions and Delegation Program that Kate uh, uh, was talking to us about a few moments ago, that that next round will be published on the 4th of January on the Department of Foreign Affairs website. Uh, uh, sorry, this is a, a separate uh, scheme that gives you an opportunity to work in the delegations as distinct from the program that Kate was talking about, which is more within the commission itself. Uh, but it's a high level traineeship uh, program that gives an opportunity to junior professionals from the member states to work in the EU delegations worldwide. And the aim of the program is to enable you to gain a first hand experience in the work of delegations and I suppose an in-depth understanding of the implementation of EU's external policies. And I know one of the questions in Slido related to external policies that I didn't get time to get to. So that may be of interest to the person who posed that question. Can I also just remind you that the department, and it's been mentioned already by uh, the minister in particular, provides supports and advice to Irish citizens who are applying for jobs in the EU. We offer online practice uh, packs for the computer-based tests and workshops, and we even do one-to-one -one training for the later stages in EU competitions. Um, there's support available, and again, just to echo what the Minister has, has flagged, uh, that this can be sourced on EU jobs, Brussels at dfa.ie. Uh, if, you, if you contact us there, we can give you other material and we can support you along the way. Um, we have flagged, I think, that this is the first webinar in a series of webinars. We hope to be back with you on the 1st of February, St. Bridget's Day when we will do a special uh, piece on women in the institutions. And I'm delighted to say Commissioner McGuinness will join us uh, for that webinar and further details uh, will be put out there shortly in relation to that. Um, follow us on Twitter and EU Jobs Ireland to keep up to date with all of our upcoming events and various traineeships and job opportunities in the EU. Before closing out, uh, can I again thank all the speakers? Can I thank in particular my colleagues, uh, Dara Coyne and Afridi Bissata, who had to deal with uh, some last minute, uh, un unforeseen and unforeseeable uh, technical issues. And I hope uh, you will have found that they did so with the plan. Uh, it was great that we were able to, to go ahead given the, the, the circumstances of today. So thank you again for, for joining us and the best of luck in your future career choices. Thanks again. Bye bye.